if you have a Bible, turn with me to Acts chapter 1 this morning, and I'm going to try to hold this a little bit closer to my mouth so it's louder and we can hear. But Acts chapter 1, like uh, you heard this morning, we are starting a brand new series. We're going to go through the book of Acts. We're going to take as long as it takes, and it's going to be good, okay? (laughs) But uh, last week, uh, hopefully you remembered, we asked you to read Acts chapter 1 so that you'd be ready for this. If you didn't, that's okay. Uh, Go home later and read Acts 1. But this week, we want you to read Acts chapter 2. So if you didn't get to read Acts 1, read Acts 1 and 2 this week. And every week, we're going to give you the Bible verses, the chapter, section, whatever it is that we're going to be going through in Acts the next week so that you can be ready for it. Because we're not going to read every bit of it. We're going to read parts of it. We're going to talk about it. But if we're all reading this together, it's going to be great. So that's the plan. Acts, get through Acts 1 and 2 this week. So what we're going to do is we're going to go chapter by chapter, and we're going to examine the little stories in the book of Acts that bring us the one big story of the book of Acts. And, and this book is an incredibly exciting book, and I believe as we go through this book that this is going to be the template and the catalyst for what Jesus really wants to do here in our midst as the church, we as the church. Now, there are 28 chapters in the book of Acts, and if you sat down and tried to read the whole book in one setting, I said this last week, but I'm going to say it again, it would take you two and a half hours about to read the book of Acts. That's how long it would be. And so it's a, it's a relatively long book in the Bible, and it's about the early church. It was church as it was historically. It's church as it should be theologically, and it's church as it could be potentially. This is what we see in the book of Acts. And I love this book. I really think that you are going to love this book as we go through it. Maybe you've read it before and, and you're not sure. Or maybe you love it already. I think as we go through it, it's going to be, come, be great for us. Now, the person who wrote the book of Acts is a guy named Luke. And Luke was a doctor by trade. And what he ended up turning into was a historian. He went from being a doctor to really a historian. In fact, even many secular historians say that he, Luke, was one of the greatest historians because of his work that he wrote here. And as we come to the book of Acts, we actually see that the book of Acts is part two of his history that he wrote down. Because part one is the gospel of Luke, surprisingly, right? Same name. So that's part one, and part two then is the book of Acts. So it's really one book with two parts. But as we get into the book of Acts, we're going to see that there's ten sermons recorded in here. And you have five of those sermons by Peter, you have four by Paul, and you have one by a guy named Stephen. And what I love about how this book is broken down and broken up is that it's, it's really, uh, you have the, the clergy guys, right, the, the church leader guys. You have Peter and Paul and people like them, but it's not just them. You also have the lay people in the church. You have like people like Stephen. And so it's telling us something here. That the church isn't just the paid professionals. That's not what the church is, okay? There's, there is paid professionals, but it's not just that. It's normal, everyday people who move the gospel message forward. That's what the church is about. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 1, it makes reference there to his former book, the book of Luke. And he says that Luke was recorded... He, he wanted to record there, and that's what he did record, was what Jesus had begun to do and teach. That's what he wrote down. And so the book of Acts, also, what that records is, is what Jesus continued to do and to teach through the working of the Holy Spirit and the growing and the spreading of the church. That's what the book of Acts is. And though Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, he is still doing work in this world. He is still at work. And so Luke, he's really about Jesus. When he writes, you you see this. He's writing about Jesus. That's his concern. That's his focus. That's his foundation, Jesus. And as you read the Gospel of Luke, you see an emphasis on the life and the death of Jesus. In the book of Acts, 
you see the focus on the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus. And so the Gospel of Luke was focused on how the Gospel was accomplished. Jesus' life, death, and a little bit of His resurrection. But Jesus lived a perfect life, and then He died a brutal death on the cross. And then you come into the book of Acts, and you see how the Gospel is to be proclaimed. That Jesus has rose again. He is alive. And how we go and take that message to the world. And though Acts gives teachings and shows us much of the work of the Holy Spirit, its focus and attention is primarily on Jesus. This is what we're going to see here is Jesus, because Jesus is the one who has come. He is the one who is present through the Holy Spirit, and He is the one who will come again. It's Jesus. And so we see this focus on Jesus, not just as the Savior, but also as the one who has proclaimed, he has been proclaimed among the nations. He's a Savior for the whole entire world, Jesus. And so going back to the first book, Luke 1, you see it up on the screen, verse 3. He writes this, it says, he, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. Now that name there, Theophilus, Theophilus, likely means one who is dear to God or loved by God. That's what that name means. And we don't know for sure if this was some generic saying for somebody, but this was a greeting toward educated people back in this time. So if you were an educated person, this is the, what you would call somebody. And it may have been a code name for this person, but I think that he's writing to somebody who is educated, who is a friend of his, and he's trying to persuade him that Jesus is who he said he is. He's like, I want you to believe, friend. I want you to understand all that Jesus did. I want you to experience what I've experienced. That's what he's writing to this person. And so if you're going to understand Jesus, he says, I'm going to have to show you the fact that there are these witnesses. There were these witnesses. And a witness is someone who has seen or heard something. And Luke is saying these guys, they have seen and experienced something when they were around Jesus. Something happened that changed their, the course of their lives and what they've done. And, and, and it's changed not even their lives, but it's changed the entire world. And so these are the witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus. And because of the resurrection, these people did supernatural things. God displayed his beauty in broken people. And so you need to pay attention, my friend, to these witnesses and what they said and what they did and what they saw. And when you think about Acts, it's not so much the Acts of the Apostles, but it's the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles. That's what we see in this. And the hero isn't Peter or Paul or anybody else there. The hero of the book of Acts is the Holy Spirit. He's at work and you know, very normal people who are on a mission. And if you're going to be on mission, he says you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the world, Jesus says. And so it's this concentric circle going out. And so the gospel, what it does is it has to go into the innermost parts of our hearts and then it goes from there to the outermost parts of the world. So it's from the innermost and it comes into all of our hearts and it fills our hearts and our heads and then it goes from there and it goes out into the entire world. That's the flow. That's the invitation. That's actually the challenge. And so as we go through this book, and if we actually do what it says, that's what we will become, a witness, a witness. See, a witness is someone who takes the gospel from their heart to the world. And Jesus is at the center. He's at the core of this. And the disciples spent time with Jesus. That's the core of all of this. And from there, we go out and we go to the church and we go as the church. 
Jesus died for the church. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades won't stand against it. Jesus was passionate about the church. And if you follow Jesus, you have to be a part of a local church. So you love Jesus and you worship Jesus and you do that with the church. And from there, you're going to be on mission, bringing Jesus to the world. You love Jesus, and then you love Jesus with the church, and then you love what Jesus loves, and that's people, and you do that with the church. You go out on mission. We are on mission together as the church. And this is what we're trying to do. This is what we see here in the book of Acts. And some people think that, you know, when they hear this, oh man, if I've got to be on mission, I've got to go tell people about Jesus, well then I've got to clean up my life and I've got to be perfect, I've got to live this perfect life. Well, actually, no. We are actually broken people. It doesn't mean that we continue to draw near to Jesus and become more like Jesus because the power of the Holy Spirit is in us, but we're not going to be perfect this side of heaven. And so, we're broken people who love Jesus And we do that with the church. We're as the church, and we can be used by Jesus throughout the world on mission. The gospel on the innermost parts of our heart to the outermost parts of the world. That's what what, what he wants for his church. And the way that this works isn't because we are good and great. The way that this works is because Jesus is alive. That's the issue here. He is alive. And Paul says in Romans chapter 8 that the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, follower of Jesus. we got to let that sink in into our lives. The same Spirit that raised Him from the dead dwells in you. Dwells in you. It's the Holy Spirit in me and in you. That's the formula. That's how this works. And you and I are going to be challenged by this book, okay? We are. It's a beautiful book, but it's a challenging book. And Luke doesn't take a great moment in history and make it boring to us, okay? It's not what he does here. This is history on fire. And what's great about it is that it intersects with our own stories and our own lives. This isn't dry history here. This connects with us on a deep level because our hearts want to be a part of something great, something bigger than just what's happening in our own lives. And so our desire here is to see that God is alive and that he is well in the world. Our passion is to be a part of a family that has a mission. In fact, that's the way that God has always worked. You go back to the very beginning, Adam and Eve. Why didn't God just create Adam? No, it wasn't just Adam, right? It was Adam and Eve. You're a family, and you have a mission that I've called you to as a family. So God says to them, you're going to rule over all of creation in my name. And then it goes south, right? You get to Genesis chapter 3, and it tells us that sin enters the world through Adam and Eve. And what does God do? Does he give up on the family and the mission? No. See, just a little bit down the road, God comes to a guy named Abraham, and he says, I'm choosing you, Abraham. You're a pagan. You worship the moon, the stars, the sea, the whatever, you know, the sun. You worship all these things, but I'm going to pull you out of that, and you're going to have a family, and this family is going to be on a mission. We have a, I have a mission for you. And Israel is going to be a light to the Gentiles. You're going to show the world that I'm real, God says to Abraham. And so God, he doesn't give up his heart for the family. So he builds the church The family has a mission to bring the Savior to the whole world. And we know that this is going to take some empowerment. Like, we can't do this in our own strength. God doesn't even leave us to our own devices and our own strength. In fact, if you read the Old Testament, there are many verses that talk about this. And Jesus actually confirms it when he's living here on earth. And he describes what we see in the book of Acts, what happens here. Let me just give you one of those Old Testament scriptures here this morning. It comes from, believe it or not, Ezekiel. 
Ezekiel chapter 36. And he says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in the statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I give you, gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. This is the promise here. This is the promise. This is in the Old Testament. This is thousands of years before Jesus is, you know, comes to earth and walks the earth as human. But this is a description of what God is going to do. Then Jesus says in John chapter 14, he says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Jesus is saying here that the Spirit that was promised in the Old Testament is now coming to live within you. And we're going to see this next week when we get into Acts chapter 2. Believe it or not, I didn't plan this. Well, you could probably believe that I didn't plan it, but hey... um, Next week, we're going to be in Acts chapter 2. Next week is Pentecost Sunday. God worked it out that way somehow. <laughs> he's, he's good, not me. But the promise in chapter 1 of Acts is, is that the Spirit is coming. And Luke leaves off in his, his gospel, his first volume, in chapter 24 of Luke, and he says, you have to wait for the Spirit. He's coming. And then it starts off in Acts chapter 1 by saying, he's talking, he's writing to his friend, about all that Jesus began to do and teach. And the began part means that he's only just getting started. He started in his physical body, but he's going to finish it with his spiritual body. And his spiritual body is the church. And the church can only do this as we are empowered by the Holy Spirit. See, Jesus... He didn't just ascend to escape the disciples and the people. He ascended to empower the church. Normal people who are empowered, indwelt by the Holy Spirit. But they had to wait. They had to wait. Tom Petty said it best. The waiting is the hardest part. So if you have your Bibles open to Acts chapter 1, let's start and look at a little bit of this this morning. We're going to go to verse 4. Like I said, we're not going to read all of the chapters. We're going to read sections of it. We're going to talk about it, and we'll, we'll see what it's saying to us. But in Acts chapter 1, verse 4, it says, And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And when it comes to the, having the Holy Spirit in our lives, some people think, you know, they're like, I won't have the same temptations because I have the Holy Spirit and they didn't back then. Well, hold on a second. Because you may have the Holy Spirit in your life, but let me tell you, the Holy Spirit may not have you. You can really not yield yourself to the Holy Spirit in your life. Allow the Holy Spirit to lead and guide and, 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 and control you, lead you, how that works. And so you can still make the same dis, uh, mistakes that they made. And one of the mistakes that they made here, and we're going to see this in Acts chapter 1, was this unrighteous politics. That became the focus and the agenda of, the, of them here. And what happens sometimes in the local church is, if we're not careful, is that the mission becomes political instead of being spiritual. Not that we don't get involved in politics, but I just want to explain this here for a second. Because this is what happened to them. This is after the resurrection, right? Jesus shows up. He was dead. Now he's alive. And the first thing that they ask him, verse 6. Look at verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. In other words, he said, wrong question, guys. That's not the one you should be asking. 
He said, you still see the nail marks in my hands. I was dead, but now I'm alive. You're worried about the wrong things. They were asking Jesus, are you going to kick the Romans out now? Are you going to make us the most powerful nation now? Now that, that you're back, is everybody going to have to bow down to us now? They missed it. They missed it. These are his disciples. They had walked with Jesus for three years and they were still clueless. They totally missed the whole point here. And so Jesus was constantly talking about the kingdom of God through the Spirit of God and the people of God. That was his message And now they're asking him, not about the kingdom of God, but they're asking him about the kingdom of Israel. And the disciples are asking, are you going to conquer Rome? And Jesus is saying, no, I want to conquer you. He's saying, if I just would get a hold of you, it doesn't matter who's in charge. It doesn't matter what's happening around you. I want a hold of you. You're missing the point. See, when the Holy Spirit is in charge, or isn't in charge, the church is distracted. Even if our desires are noble, if the Holy Spirit isn't in charge, we get distracted. And it's easy for us to lose the mission, the plan. It's easy for us to get off course. Then another mistake that we can make sometimes as the church is unrighteous activism. Look at verse 9 of Acts chapter 1. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Now, they're just staring up into the clouds, and I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't really like to be, I don't like to get in trouble. It's not something I like, you know. Maybe you do. I've never liked it. Maybe you, you're okay with it. But most people don't like getting in trouble. These guys are getting in trouble by an angel. That's a bad day. It's a bad day when you're getting in trouble by an angel, right? An angel tells you you're missing it. And so they're looking up into the sky, and, and how I, I visioned this is they're looking up and they're thinking, you know, Jesus is gone. He's not here on earth anymore, and so we've got all this work we've got to do. We better get going with it. We have all these things that we have to do. It's all on us. We need to complete and, you know, have go for right now, have complete justice in this world so that we have to fix everything Because now Jesus is gone. It's on us. And we have to do this in our own strength. Some churches actually make that mistake. They say God doesn't do miracles anymore. He doesn't intervene, so it's all on us. We have got to go to work, and that's unrighteous activism. On the other side of that, we have some that have unrighteous passivism, if I can say that. But this is where... You're looking up in the sky and you say, well, he's going to come back someday and he's going to fix everything when he comes back. So we really don't have to do anything. We're just going to go start our own culture and we're going to hide from the big bad world. And then Jesus is going to come back at some point and he'll fix it all. Now, we don't want to forget that Jesus is up in the sky, but he's not just up in the sky. Jesus is on the throne. He's not just floating up in a cloud, wringing his hands. He is on the throne. And we don't want to stand around looking up the sky and saying, well, as soon as you get down here, Jesus, things are going to get done. We don't hide from the world. And so there's this delicate nature that we're going to see as we go through the book of Acts here of entering and challenging our culture. We enter in. But we also challenge. And some people can find out what the culture is doing and they enter into the culture, but they don't really ever challenge the culture. 
Others are great at challenging and throwing truth bombs all over everything and protesting everything, but they aren't great at entering in and being sympathetic to the non-moral aspects of our culture. And so they reject everything. And the balance here and the call of the church is for us to enter into the culture but to also challenge it. That's our responsibility, and sometimes it's hard to discern that. And that's what the church is there for. That's what we're, we're, we're following the, the redemptive potential. When we follow the redemptive potential, that's what we do. We enter in and we challenge. Sometimes we mess that up, though, and we enter in too much and we don't challenge enough, or we challenge too much and we're not really entering in. And there's this delicate balance here of the gospel that's our call as the church. And the church of Acts had this balance, and we'll see it as we go through. And they weren't always perfect, but they were always trying to be focused on the mission that God had called them to. And Jesus is, is talking uh, to us about the, the reality of the church being an instrument of the gospel for the whole world. Actually, being the instrument for the gospel of the whole world. And so the innermost parts of the gospel in our hearts to the outermost parts of the world... Ed Stetzer said this. He says, It isn't that God has a mission for his church. It is that God has a church for his mission. And the mission has always been the same. God wants to reconcile the world. He loves the world. He's, he's reweaving the world into a mosaic of all of his glory. And the church is the instrument for this. This is how he, what he's using. is using us. The church isn't necessarily the goal, but the church is the instrument for the gospel, which really means here that God takes this very seriously. Very seriously. And so every person in the church matters because the church is God. It's his way of showing the, the world something. He's showing the world something through us as the church. Things he wants to show is diversity without racism, creativity without elitism. And the only place where you're going to find social economic diversity is really the church. Now, where else do we see this? Why don't we see it anywhere else? It's because God, and why does God do this in the church? Why does he want to work and have all these things happening? It's because God wants to show the world that he loves the world through the church. And yes, you can encounter God through individuals. God does that all the time. But there's just something that happens when the church is working the right way that it looks like Jesus and it attracts people in ways that individuals simply can't. That's the beauty of the local church. When we are working the way God wants us to, we're living the way God wants us to, we're loving God, we're loving each other, we're encouraging each other, we're, we're sometimes even challenging each other. But we're all equal at the foot of the cross because Jesus is what matters. And so every person matters. That's the whole point of chapter 1 because then they decide here that they have to replace Judas. And then it talks about in chapter 1, if you read it or if you've read it before, you, you remember this, right? It talks about Judas going out and hanging himself and his guts spilling out. It's really crazy, right? Like, why is that in the Bible? Like, why do we have that? Why does the Bible focus on this? Like, why didn't it take more time to give us some more things that we could use in our lives, but we have this story instead? Well, I want to tell you something. This story, even though it's short right here, is very extremely relevant for us. Because what it's showing us is that every leader matters. Every missionary matters. And they go to great lengths here in chapter 1 to, to say that we have to have somebody else because eleven's not enough. We need 12. And what's ironic, I think, and interesting about all of this is we never hear about this guy who replaces Judas again after the story in chapter 1. Right? Like we don't know what happened to him. We don't know what goes on, what he said, but we do know this, that God is saying something in this. He's saying every missionary matters. Every leader matters. And it's important what you do. It's important that you're here and you're on board and you're on mission. It's, it isn't just the job of the paid professional. It's the job, it isn't even just the job of the superstar Christian. It's our job as the church, all of us. 
And this is the part of the story that's challenging us because as Americans, we have adopted this view of the church that it fits our own lifestyle and our own culture and our own consumerism. And really that's what it is. It's consumerism. Because consumerism is where can I get the best deal while giving the least amount? That's consumerism, right? Where can I get the best thing while giving the least? And that's great at Costco, right? It's awesome on Amazon. You know, like I'm going to do some comparison shopping. I'm going to look around. I'm going to find what the thing I want at the best price. And in a lot of ways, that's actually good stewardship to do that. The problem is, though, is that we take that idea and we apply it to our Christianity and to the church, and that's where it gets us into trouble. And so what I want to do real quickly here is just compare that. Consumerism versus a missionary. Because what a consumer says, I can, appre- I can experience God all by myself. Is that true? Yeah, it's true. Right? Like, I can read the Bible and I can pray by myself. But I also, you know, I do that at home. I pray at home and I can do that all. But I also need to do that in our small groups or at church here together. We pray and read the Bible together. We weren't made to do our spirituality all by ourselves, solo. We were made to connect with the church. That's what we were made for. Actually, when you read the commands in the New Testament, they're all plural. So when you see the Word and you read the Word and you don't just think me then, you think us, the whole church. And that's why a missionary says, I can experience more of God through others. So if you come to church and you think, well, this is all about me, let me tell you, you're off. That's not what God intends. You may be a great American, but you're not a very good Christian. You're missing it. You're not getting it as much. Then a consumer says, I can participate in whatever I want to. It's, I do what I want to do. If I want to come to church, then I'll come to church. If I want to join a group, then I'll join a group. If I want to give money, then I'll give money. But there's never a thought to that maybe I'm not the one who's on the throne. Maybe I'm not the king. Maybe I'm not the Lord. Because a missionary says, I'm going to embrace what the Bible says about the church. I'm not the one who's in charge. I'm going to submit. I'm not the head of the church. Jesus is the head of the church, so I submit to Jesus. And I want to do what God wants me to do. I want to participate in what God wants me to participate in, not what I just want to participate in. And this is hard. I get it. This is really hard. But this is what it means to submit to Jesus as the head of the church. This is what it means to actually be a part of a spiritual community. You don't get to call the shots. I don't get to call the shots. A consumer says, I'm committed as long as my needs are met. In other words, I'll plug in, I'll get involved, I'll submit, but the second my needs aren't met, I am out. That doesn't always mean that you leave the church, though. Sometimes that's just pulling back and sitting, and sometimes that's okay for a little bit, but a lot of times it's not because we aren't dealing with the stuff that's happening in our lives. And so we're just saying, okay, when, you know, all my needs aren't being met, so I'm just going to, I'm out, I'm out. What a missionary says is, I will serve others' needs through the church. We realize this isn't about me. And when you give, when you serve, when you sacrifice, what happens is, is your needs actually get met in a deeper way than if it was just all about you and you came in and you sat and just received. I think sometimes we have some repentance to do as God's people. Consumers, whoa, flew right by that one. There we are. Consumers ask, what can the church do for me? Missionaries ask, what can I do for the church? And that's really just what this is all about here. It's the, is the object you or is the object others? And you can move around and you can continue to focus on yourself or you can come to the end of all of that and say, well, you know what? This isn't about me. It's about God and it's about what God's calling me to. And, and I know God loves people and so I want to love people. And when you tap into that, let me just tell you, something changes in your life. You grab hold of what God has for you. And this is our invitation as we study the book of Acts. To move from a consumer to a missionary. 
And all of us need that movement. All of us are consumeristic because, hey, we live in America. But increasingly, God is going to call us to move out from ourselves as the center of us to God being the center of us and that He is King, He is Lord, He is Savior. And as soon as we start following Jesus, what He's going to do is He's going to put us into the lives of broken people. That's what He does. That's what Acts 1.8 is all about. Go to there. We're going to wrap this up real quickly. But it says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. That's the mission that we are all on. That's the opportunity that we have. And some of us are so bored because we're only focused on our own lives. And if you only focus on your own life, you realize how boring and how pathetic it is. And I'm not saying that you know, because, we, because we don't all have lives. We do. Maybe some of you don't. I don't know. But most of us, we have a life, right? I'm not, that's not what I'm saying here. But it's the reason we find it that way, boring and pathetic, is because we are mainly not made for that way. We weren't made to do that, just to focus on ourselves. It's not how God made you. We were made for something bigger, a greater story than our own story, a bigger picture of, of our life than what God, you know, or than, what, than what we can see right now. That's what right in front of our face. We're made for something bigger than that. That's the challenge here. And so Jesus in us is better than Jesus beside us. We are not doing this alone. Like the disciples were like freaked out because Jesus is gone. They're staring up into the sky and they're like, now what are we going to do? He's gone. And Jesus says, it's to your advantage that I go. Now instead of me being in one place at one time, now my spirit is here and he can be with you all places at all times. And it starts right where we live. And so my challenge to all of us this morning is is to repent of our consumerism and to see ourselves and for you to see yourself as a missionary. Because let me tell you something, that's the way God sees you. He sees you, He sees me as a missionary. And that's actually the call of God on your life, to be a missionary. You may not go to Africa. You may not go to Mexico. Maybe you will. You may not. But you might go to your neighbor. You might go to your workplace. And the Holy Spirit is in you, follower of Jesus. And you have the power to be witnesses. And that's the challenge we're going to see as we go through the book of Acts. Would you bow your heads this morning? And consumerism is great as shoppers, and that's, uh, that's good, you know, when we're looking for things, but it's not good when we come into the church. And maybe some of us have had that mindset where I'm going to just be a consumer when it comes to church. As long as I'm being met, or my needs are being met, then I'm good. If it doesn't fit my needs, then I'm going to find something different. Maybe you haven't been willing to just step out and to be that missionary. And this is what God is calling us all to. And I feel like one of the damages that the COVID lockdowns did for us was we all learned to sit and watch church on our TV, you know, in our TVs, on our couches. And we just received. And I believe that the challenge that God is calling for us today is now to step up and say, we want to serve, we want to be missionaries. We want to be involved in what God is doing in our church, in our city, in our surrounding areas because He's got a plan. And let me tell you, He loves the people that are around you, your neighbors, your co-workers, your family.
And as we look at the days that we're in, we see that, you know, Jesus could return at any moment. And the call of God on each one of our lives is to be a missionary. And so this morning, I want us just with our heads bowed to repent of our consumerism and to say, God, I've, I, I know the call that you've placed on my life to be a missionary, and that missionary might mean I'm just going to go to my neighbor. It might be to a family member that doesn't know Jesus. It might be to the people I work with. But Lord God, I pray that you would just empower me by the Spirit that lives within me, Your Spirit, God, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead to be a missionary to the people that You give me the opportunity to speak to, Lord God. That many would come to know You, Jesus, because You are the way, the truth, and the life. That salvation is only found in You, Lord God. And we know that you love those people that you've placed us around. And so God, give us a heart. Give us a love for those people around us as we're being sent as missionaries. Would you just take a moment and talk to God about this this morning? Heavenly Father, we just uh, thank you so much for your word. We thank you for your presence in our life. We thank you for the work that you've done to bring us salvation, your life, death, resurrection, and ascension. We thank you that you've gifted us your spirit, Lord God. And sometimes even if it scares us a little bit, we are thankful for the call that you have placed on each of our lives to be missionaries, Lord God. And God, I pray right now that we would just step into the calling in our lives if we haven't already. Maybe we've stepped into that calling and we've backed away for a while because of things that have happened in our lives, Lord God. I pray that we would just renew that calling in our lives to be missionaries. God, there's a world out there that is hurting, that is lost, that is confused, that has lots of questions, and we have the answer. It's you, Lord Jesus. And so, God, I pray that you would give us opportunity to share the truth of the gospel, the good news of Jesus with those around us. You'd embolden us by your Spirit, God. You'd strengthen us, empower us by your Spirit so that we might be able to go forth and share. That you'd give us the words to speak. We'd realize that we don't save anyone, Lord God. It's your work, and you use us. So God, I just pray that we would just be those people to truly be your church, to go out on mission. God, I pray you'd strengthen us. I pray that we would have your hope and your joy and your purpose in our lives, Lord God. Lord, I pray again for those that need healing this morning, God, that you would touch them and bring healing in their lives. God, I pray for uh, just continued unity and strengthening of us as the body with you being the head, Lord God. And we worship you and praise you. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. And so this 